I truly believe that too many people are settling and settling due to fear. The solution to all this, Mark, truly is a commitment to personal development, is a commitment to do the work. When I read your, we do hard things, right? To me, the solution is, okay, how do we do hard things easier? through our commitment to personal development. The empowerment that comes from walking through the world on your terms, it's so much more satisfying than being a reactive, disappointed victim. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, yeah. <laughs> Today's guest thought she had it all, career, health, relationships. And then one day as she watched her marriage fall apart and her business go completely sideways, she realized that she didn't have it all. That in fact, she had been settling in the most important areas of her life, settling for good enough. But as she shares in her new book, Outrageous Achievement, not only did she not have to settle, but she was able to turn everything around and then some. You have to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Leslie Zan. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. 61. <laughs> so the reason why I want to start there, which I think is, is, is really interesting to me, is you've had such an amazing career. Uh, you know, I, I, I went through your LinkedIn, I went through your bio, I mean, I, I deep dived. But in 2011, in 2011, you decide that you're going to leave corporate, that you're going to strike out on your own, that you're going to do your own thing. And the reason I mentioned happy birthday, 61, is 2011 was, was what, 10 years ago. So you were 51. And in my experience, when I think about people in my life, uh, the, my, my friends and their parents, my, my own, some of my own family members, they got really scared at 50. They got really scared at 52. They got really scared at 55. I have literally had conversations with them where I said, you're so young. Why are you, why are you running away from your career? Why are you giving up? Why? And, and they take a step out because they think they want retirement, whatever it is. And then, and then they're too scared to come back. How is it at that age you had the, the, the courage or the ability to not only take this massive swing, but I know so many people who, who give up so early, it seems to me. Oh my gosh, this is so good. So like many times in our lives, something traumatic had to happen for many of us to make a big shift, something has to happen. So for me at that moment in my 50s, I, when I was 50, my husband left and it was very unexpected. And it was a 15 year marriage for years. I heard I love you more every day. I love you more every day until evidently one day. And so I came home from a gig as I'm a speaker. I came home from a gig and found foot long red hair all over the house. And as you can see, I'm a perky brunette with short hair. So that started a... Um, very difficult period of my time, fetal on the floor, sad. And it was because of the grief and the loss and the betrayal of my marriage that sent me on this journey. And I don't like a lot of people out there, both men and women. For me, it started, I was walking on the bay. I live in San Diego. I was walking along the bay, crying and thinking to myself, how did this happen? Like, so totally unexpected. I'm 50. I started menopause. I'm now going to get a divorce. It was completely unexpected. And I realized that day on the Bay Mark that I couldn't think of one risky thing I had done in 30 years. Now, I speak for a living. That scares a lot of people. That doesn't scare me. John and I traveled. We certainly had a good life, but I couldn't think of one time where I truly stretched myself out of my comfort zone, hmm. which made me cry even harder. So I decided that day, I kind of stamped my foot, had a, had a little kid moment, stamped my foot and said, I'm going to do something risky. And kept walking along the bay. And my first thought was, what's the scariest thing I could think of? Well, skydive, of course, isn't that everybody? Uh -huh. I'm too afraid to skydive, honestly. Have you, have you well, 
everybody. I said, no, I can't do that. Well, why not? It's the scariest thing I can think of. And then I kept walking. I thought, well, I live in San Diego. I could paraglide. You know, we're very famous here for paragliding off Torrey Pines. And then I thought, like, who jumps off a cliff on a kite? And then I thought, well, bungee jumping, everybody bungee jumps. And I immediately thought, well, I don't want to hurt my back. I mean, in that moment, I realized I was so masterful. Well, you could do this. Well, of course you're not. Take this risk. Well, don't do it. Stretch yourself. Absolutely not. Mm. That was a life changing moment. And I went home that day, went immediately to my phone and called Skydive San Diego. And two days later, I jumped out of a plane because it was the scariest thing I could think of. That's yep. that's impressive because I am afraid of heights. Um, it's it's remarkable to me. I mean, I got in an argument uh, years ago now, but I, I like you, you know when you have those conversations with friends that you don't realize. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm a devil's advocate. You know, if you say we got to go left, I'm like, well, what about right? Uh, and so I end up getting into conversations that turn into debates that turn into arguments with people. I don't even mean to do that. And, and there's this one that happened where I think I lost a friendship over it. Cause I thought we were being philosophical. He did not, he thought that we were being personal. Um, but, but in that I told him at one point, cause he accused me of being very safe and narrow minded. And I said, listen, I, I, I own my own business. I own my house outright with no mortgage. I've been married for a long time. I have kids. I got my life figured out. Um, and I didn't realize when I was defending all these things that I did that was super safe and super great and how much I had set up my life at 30 and everything else. It was actually a reflection of just like really small, scared thinking. I, did, I didn't realize that all the things that I took proud in, pride in for not be, having risk everywhere was actually me not being challenged or small or anything. And so I'm so impressed with that moment where you decide, like, I'm going to go bungee jumping and do this thing. Well, we don't realize oh, we're jumping out of a out plane. Of yes, yes. Jumping out of the sky. And and I, I'm convinced now because I've done now I'm masterful at moving through my fears. But at the time, uh, the, the lesson to for me was for most of us, we don't realize that we're settling and we settle out of fear, a variety of fears, mm-hmm. but we, but we settle, but we don't realize where in our lives we're settling. So settling in a, in a marriage, perhaps that you may know is not working, but are in great denial about it, or we settle with our health or we settle with our careers or we settle in our creative expression and we settle because things are good enough. It's not painful enough. And that was the lesson for me that I had gone on through my 30s and my 40s to my 50th year, letting things be good enough. And I made that made the decision after the whole skydive experience that I was not going to go for the rest of my life. So to go back to your very first question, you know, I'm 61 now. I have 25 years, 25 years left. I'm so clear of what I got left. And the woman I want to evolve into and the people I want to attract and what do I want to accomplish? In fact, I was saying with my coffee buddies this morning at the Starbucks because they were congratulating me about my book launch. And I said, you know, I don't want any regrets. Like, I don't want any regrets. I'm prepared to crawl over glass, not not let go of my morals and not not change the woman I want to be and stay humble and say gratitude. But, man, I am prepared to crawl over glass. So I do not have any major regrets. So whenever you have one of these big breakthroughs and I'm going to speak in absolute terms, I know it's not everybody, but when you have one of these big breakthroughs, often we look back and and shame or beat ourselves up for like, why did I waste my time? Like, we can't get to the point of like, well, you didn't know better that. And so I've had a real, you know, a few years, the last few years have been really transformative for me. And I, only now, after three years of kind of transformation, am I willing to accept that I didn't waste my 20s, that I didn't waste my 30s, that I like that it's led me to where I am today. But I spent so much time going, why didn't I know this earlier? Why didn't I do this earlier? I wasted so much time. How do you how did you write? How did you right size that? I, I just I stopped thinking about that a long time ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really like, I did all the inner child work, right? Like all the little inner child work, the little Leslie work. And, and from doing the work, 
I mean, bottom line, my, my answer to your whole theme, how do we do the hard stuff, mm -hmm. the hard things is we got to be willing to do the work. And I've done the work. So I did all the inner child work. So I can, I'm not perfect at any of this stuff, Mark. I am just, I do my best and I practice it. But when I start to go backwards or have any kind of shame or regrets or how did I do this? Or like you said, what was I thinking? I come right back to being present. Like I do my best to. And does it still happen to you? Do you, still, do you still catch yourself? I catch myself much faster because it's a choice, right? Like I, I'm really keen on we're a reflection of our thoughts. And if I'm, if I believe that, and I'm aware of my thoughts. When my thoughts start going to the dark side in any way, I try to reel them back in. I will take responsibility. Mm -hmm. I will forgive myself. I will forgive others. Forgiveness is a whole other conversation, but a beautiful conversation. And try to bring myself right back to the present and focus on everything that is working in my life and not focus on the things that perhaps didn't happen or that aren't working. And if something is not working, then I have to come up with a solution. All right, what do I want to do? Am I prepared to settle and, and handle that this is not working? Or do I want to decide what do I want it to look like and then come up with a game plan? And then, as you say, do the hard things and make it happen. I love it. I love it. Now, I know... Um that this thought of good enough was, was transformative for you, a really important thing in your life. You know, I used to say, and it was one of my most important values when I was starting my company. And the thing for me was good enough is never enough. And that's what I would say, because I didn't want other people's good enough or, or, or settling to dictate what was for us. And I've stopped saying that actually, because I realized that I'm a perfectionist. And so nothing is ever good enough for my standards. Good enough. Like I, I actually have to start embracing a little bit of good enough because otherwise I can't move on. But, <laughs> but, you know, what, what happened with you in this, this moment, this idea of like, oh, like, like good enough being this, this transformative thing in your life. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. I went to a seminar. I went to hear Craig Valentine. Craig Valentine is a very well-known Toastmaster Grand Champion speaker. And I was sitting in the audience and he was about 10 minutes into his shtick and he looked at us and he asked a question. He asked us, are we letting our good enough get in the way of our great? Mm. And he was speaking to me mm. and I started with little quiet tears. And then I realized I was going to have an ugly girl cry. I left the ballroom. I missed his whole presentation. Oh. I ran to my hotel room. Like, what more did I need to hear? Like, that was what I was supposed to hear. I ran to my hotel room. I cried on the bed for about 45 minutes. I finally got off the bed, sat at the desk, staring at myself. You know, there's always mirrors in, at the desk in a hotel room. And I'm red eyed and runny nose and I thought, oh, my gosh, I in all areas of my life in all major areas of my life, I had been letting my good enough get in the way of my great. It was transformative. And I, I did what I always do in times like that. I grabbed the paper and pencil and and I just started scribbling ideas and thoughts and areas of my life. And, and it really began the, the, the foundation of what would ultimately become my blueprint for how I want to run my life. And, and fast forward, last year I was invited to speak on the Grow Rich Thinking Tour and I was working on my keynote and I wanted some extra special help. And I actually reached out to Craig. And I hired him to help me with oh. this talk. And through working together one time, I got to tell him that whole story. I got to tell him how he, in a Zoom call, I got to tell him how that question had changed my life. And the two of us together just had this warm moment of connection. It was a beautiful thing. And, and it's so rare in our lives that we get to, to tell the people that really made a difference yeah. how they made a difference. I love that yeah. so much. I, you know, it's it's funny because 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 you do this a lot. I do this a little bit. The idea of speaking or helping people or what have you. I mean, this is this is your thing. You're you're really an expert at it and really good at it. But I know that anyone who does this professionally says, you know, thought leadership, helping people, whatever it might be, coaching. They say it's you know it's all about it's it's service. Certainly, you know, we know that this is about service. 
And we, and I've heard people say, you know, if I can just connect with one person in the audience, that's my job. My job is to connect with one person, but I, I honestly lose sight of that. Like, like I see numbers and, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think about that one person, but, but you were that one person. I've been that one person. I, you know, at, at, at conferences and at events or podcasts you hear, um, do you find yourself having to remind yourself of the impact that you actually have, or is this just within you? That's such a good question. And this all revolves around ego and humility. Um, I'm very fortunate that there's a lot of adoration and a lot of support and a lot of love that comes my way all the time. And years ago, I made the commitment to filter it all through my gratitude filter rather than my ego filter. And that has really served me well. So the, the more achievement the more grateful I become. And those aren't just words. I am absolutely convinced that from the moment I started my business, my commitment to service and making an authentic impact has been the number one reason why I have also created financial success as well. People know it. You can't fake it. (laughs) A few people can fake it. I can't fake it. All right. And I, you know, so my, uh, you know, the audience knows I'm telling my truth. I'm doing yeah. my best. I'm being authentic. Yeah. And yes, I always say a little prayer before I take the stage or before I do um, a Zoom presentation or whatnot, that the perfect information is going to land on the perfect person. And I do see myself in that audience um, with Craig Valentine when I say that little prayer. So yeah. And you know what? I've, I've, I've checked out your Facebook lives and all the stuff you do. And I see that. I mean, I, I, I feel like the community you have and that you've been able to build is, is authentically connected. Um, can you tell me about Outrageous Achievement, your, your new book? Yeah, it launched this week, launched on Tuesday on my birthday. I launched it on my birthday on purpose. And I'm very proud to say within less than 21 hours, it became an international number one bestseller. And I'm quite, I'm full. I sit before you, Mark, full of just humility and gratitude and, and, refreshed inspiration, right? To do more, to make a a bigger impact. So Outrageous Achievement is is a book, it's a culmination of trainings and topics and concepts that have landed so well on the audience over the years. Concepts and topics where the visceral response was just inarguable that I knew I had tapped into something. And, And I put it all together. It was a true label of love. Although lots of lessons of doing the hard things, certainly in writing the book. And yet, um, I'm so happy to see it get out into the world. I want people to know and learn how they can create outrageous achievement in any areas of their life. Chapter two is all about settling. I truly believe that that is pervasive in our world today, that too many people are settling and settling due to fear. Chapter one is all about overcoming the five universal fears of rejection, failure, success, judgment, change that that keep too many people stuck, too many people playing small, too many people afraid to shine their bright, to be as great as they can be. Hmm. And so that that was the impetus for Outrageous Achievement. And having it out in the world now just makes me so happy. I love it. I love it. And so because, of course, in your past and, and, and everything that you've spoken about, I mean, fear stops all of us and slows us all down. Um, and settling was, was certainly something that you've spoken to. I know that my friends, um, you know, every time I've been challenged to raise my standards, it's been some of the most, <laughs> um, you know, like I had a client that I've worked with for years in the fall get really, really angry with me. Like, like really angry, like angry enough that I'm like, I would normally get defensive, but it was so uncomfortable that all I can do is say, like, just apologize as much as possible, try to make things right um, and say, listen, this only happens once or twice a year, but something happens that I don't forget. And you just taught me a lesson. So thank you. And I don't know if he believed me, but um, 
when you realize that you, that your standards aren't meeting other people's expectations or you, or your own hopes and dreams or whatever it is the first thing that i tend to do is just get defensive about it and try and rationalize why it makes sense and this and that so what's the best way if people aren't hitting if clients aren't yelling at you if if your friends aren't gracious or loving enough to kind of pull you aside and say hey i think this is something you need to work on i mean it's it's a big blind spot isn't it right it is couple of things i've learned um this is actually one of my life's lessons, which is interesting that you would ask this question. So I believe that with today's technology, we are all moving faster than the speed of light, whether we realize it or not. We're on the text, we're on the, the, the laptop, we're on the phone, the PMs are coming in. Like There's just all this phonetic activity going on. And whether we realize it or not, we are training ourselves to be reactive. Mm rather than proactive. So when that text comes in, you know, we're quick to respond defensively. You know, when that phone call comes in, we know the first one, I don't answer it, but we answer it anyway. You know, I normally ask my audience, can you think of just one thing you did in the last week? Just one thing you've done that now looking back, you can think, mm, I wished I wouldn't have responded quite that way. And I get all the uncomfortable giggles. You know what I mean? The uncomfortable yeah. body language laughter because it happens to all of us. So again, I'm not perfect at any of this. I do my best through awareness. So I'm at a point now because I move, I move fast naturally, right? I tell my audience, if I drank coffee, it all needs seatbelts, <laughs> right? So, so I have learned that when things like that happen, I pause. Like you've got to pause, take three breaths, step away from the laptop. Don't text, don't respond to the email. Don't pick up the phone, just pause for a moment so that when you are ready, you can respond on your terms. You can respond more rationally. You can respond with a more open heart. You can respond with your points you want to make. You can respond as an adult. You can respond with more generosity or more tolerance. So you're not looking back a week from now saying, God, I wished I wouldn't have done it that way. So it's really step one is just pausing for a moment. And crazy enough, sometimes you might even want to sleep on it. I know you can't even imagine that. <laughs> the next right? day, that, the next that's day, unacceptable. Uh, you know, so it's even sleeping on it so that when you come to the conversation, you are coming from not from emotions, but from humanity, from a willingness to deal with the situation, whether it's a combative situation or whether a loving situation, whatever that, whatever it is. Um, and then how your other half was, your other part of the question was, how do you respond when they're coming at you through negativity or they're not liking what you're doing? You know, I had a situation um, happen just recently where I was coaching a group of leaders and I had forgotten sales leaders mm -hmm. and I had forgotten that this group, even though their name by title specified a certain level of expertise, the, the title was far greater than, than, than their, current, their expertise, their expertise level. level. Right. Exactly. Thank so you. you were, you were teaching kind of over their, my their tone heads. was wrong. Okay. Like my tone was for a more experienced group of leaders. So it did not land well. And this rarely happens to me. And, but again, like you, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do when things like that happen? I know how I want to respond. Like I immediately took ownership of it. Like I immediately called back. I immediately apologized. I immediately asked to have um, a Zoom again with this group of leaders so that I could share. To me, it was a perfect leadership lesson. Like how often do we deal with people? We think our message is landing well. We don't know that it isn't. And then things are left unsaid. What a gotten a punch in the gut when you find out this thing that you thought you did well didn't land right my my feelings i felt bad like i'm a professional like you i felt bad and my job is never to distract my job is to hold them up and let them see the possibilities and so taking ownership when we make a mistake i think is critical and and, and it's, it's a it's a 
to lost talent, I think, anymore these days. Because people, it's too easy to hide behind the technology and hide behind a text or hide behind an email where I immediately called up and said, I would like a Zoom. I want to see their faces again so that I can apologize, explain, and make it right. So I, I think that's just part of being a good human, certainly part of leadership to take responsibility when we don't do our best, intentional or unintentional. And so that just recently happened. Um, and then, like you said, also, we're not going to please everybody. Hmm. We just have to. But I want to do. I want I, everyone to like me. <laughs> I know you do. We all want everyone to like us, but it's just not going to happen. And so being able to, you know, it's interesting you bring that. So I have a leadership code, you know, years ago, probably I was early 30s. I was given a job, a position that my maturity and my experience was not prepared for. And, and I took the position and it was not easy at all. And, and I would go to bed upset and feeling less than or feeling wasn't doing my, good enough. And how did I get myself here? And I created this leadership code Three simple questions. So, and I've, I still to this day use this leadership code. So I ask myself, did I tell my truth? Like I do a lot of core value work, Mark, twice a year. So truth is a high core. Truth is equal to health to me. Mm -hmm. One and two, even Stephen. So did I tell my truth? Number two, did I live up to my commitment? So did, if I say I'm going to be there at three, I'm there at three. If I say I'm going to deliver, I deliver. So number two, did I live up to my commitment? And number three, did I do my best? I do my best. So if I tell my truth, live up to my commitments and do my best, that's all I can do. And that sets me free. Mm. And you're able, like with this framework, you're just able to let it go. I when, think. when I would still be tense or anxious or want to beat myself up or what have you. Well, that's a good point, Mark. So to, to ask you back, like, how was that serving you? How is that? Well, changing? listen, listen, everything that's holding us back isn't serving us. <laughs> but, um, you know, like I was I was thinking I was thinking about this. And um, today, this isn't something I've really talked to anyone about. But, you know, I can't I, I'm, I'm working so hard right now. I'm not I shouldn't say that I'm really concerned with how condescending I sound to my team or to my wife or to my family. And I never saw myself as a condescending person. I always say. I would say, you know, I'm coming across as condescending. And finally, I had a friend say, no, Mark, you're not coming across as condescending. You are condescending. Like the way that you explain things to people, you think you're trying to help them. And all they hear is all the reasons they're not good enough. And so I was thinking about this today because I, because I know it's something I need to work on. It's hurting my relationships. Um, I almost don't know where to start with it. And and so it's, it's the same as... Um, Am I willing to do the work to let it go? Or do I just say, well, this is who I am. And if you're going to work with me and love me and, and like me, then this is what you have to deal with. But that doesn't seem very fair to the people in my life. So, so this is the type of thing where I would, I would get, I'm trying to figure out, is this something that I just am? Is it something I deal with? Or is it something I fix? And your framework of, did I share my truth? Did I try my best? Did I live up to my commitment? Um, seems similar to me. It's like, it's like a, it's a, it's a process you're going to work through and you can willing to let it go. I don't know. I don't know if I can work through a process and let things go like that. And you say, is it serving me? I know being condescending is not serving me. I, I still don't know how to attack it or whatnot. So I'll throw a few things out just and you can think about it. I don't have to be right, but just for sake of a conversation, right? So you only, you can decide the fact that you even brought it up. And the fact it's that bothering you, me. It's bothering me. It is bothering. <laughs> I want people to like me. I want my kids to not be scared of me. You know, all those things. The fact that you brought it up in such a public way with someone you don't even know means it's ready to come out. And so I would have you um, I would have you do a little journaling. I don't think you really want to be condescending. So um, I think it's going to take a little hard you know, the hard thing right now. So first of all, I think it's a choice. Am, am I prepared to be this way? If your answer is yes, then you're going to live with consequences. If I'm not prepared to be this way, then what are some solutions? What could I do? I could focus on what they're doing right first. I can monitor my words. I can lead with, here's where you're doing well, right? Hey, Pat, like these are all the things you're doing well. Here's the areas where we want to improve. It's purposeful language. So perhaps even just 
thinking about your language and making sure to bring the positive in as well as um, the corrections or where they need improvement. I don't think you want to be condescending and I know you want to be liked and we all do. And that's just a matter of defining the person you want to be. Like, who do you want to be, Mark? And how do you want to walk through the world? And what does that look like to you? And it doesn't matter. And it's, it's impacting your relationships and impacting your team. I'd say that's a pretty good red flag to consider. How can you how can you do the hard thing yeah. and address that? Although truly to your whole point of doing the hard things, it really is going to boil down to what's your perception of the word hard, right? Okay. Like when you say, oh, how do you do the hard things? Well, if I shift how I think about hard things and don't make them hard, well, then I can change anything in my life. Right. Like you have got the issue with perhaps wanting to make a shift in the ways that you communicate. When I think of hard things, when I saw the title of your show and I think of hard things, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Well, what's your perception of things being hard and why do I want to do it? And my mind immediately went to yoga. Like the first times Renee would put me in a pose and I would look at her and go, ah, that was hard. And then I'd stop myself and say, well, I'm not going to say that again because that's just going to make it hard. So then I'd get in the pose and go, that is a fascinating pose, right? So I would just change the way I posture the situation. Or I thought about writing the book uh, immediately came to mind up at 4 a.m. every morning to write for nine months because I wanted to get it, the work, yeah. the writing done before my whole day of work. And I'm a morning person anyway. And so what is my perception of hard? I didn't get out of bed and walk into the office going, oh, shit, I got to write today. I would stop on purpose in the living room before I'd come into my office and out loud it became a game. Did it every morning. Out loud, I would just set my head back and go, I wonder what fascinating things are going to come out of my head today, right? So I didn't make writing hard. I made it, you know, a fascinating journey. Um, I think of my cycling. I don't know if you're an athlete. I, I started cycling with COVID because the indoor rock climbing gym closed. And God, I think back now, that was a Petri dish before, before COVID. I never really thought about it. But so I got up my grandma bike, started riding, met a guy who's a cyclist. He agreed to mentor me. And I'll, then I traded in my hybrid bike for a road bike. Never thought my wildest dreams I would ride a bike on the street with the cars. And then went to even the SPD pedals, the clip in pedals. And now I ride 40 to 60 miles every single weekend. I'm stronger at 61, more fit in 61 than probably my whole life. And when I think of your do the hard things, it makes me think of the first time I started climbing hills. There was a hill called Talbot. And it was a long grade. And then at the very top, a really steep grade at the top for five months, Mark, I had to stop before the top grade because I didn't have uh, this skill getting up. How you know, good climb. did it feel to do the entire climb without stopping? But it took five months. Yeah. I mean, you got to be willing to do the hard stuff, but it's the perception of what's hard. I did not get at the bottom of the hill every day to the point and go, this hill is going to kick my ass again. No, it was my perception of what's hard. I went into the hill every day or every weekend with what I call high intention. I'm going to get to the top and low attachment. If I, if I have to stop, it's still fun and I'm still getting stronger and I'm still getting mm. more skill. High well, intention. Well, there's, there's something really interesting. Low right attachment. A high intention, low attachment. Where did you, where did you come up with that? That's good. No, I heard, a, I heard um, uh, a client said that actually one day. Like I used to say it in a hundred words. I used to say, you got to be a hundred percent emotionally committed, right? And yeah. be Professionally detached. That was Leslie's language. And one day he heard me say that so many times. He says, Leslie, high attachment, low, uh, high, um, high intention, intention, low attachment. attachment. Right? You took my hundred words and said it in four. And I thought, gosh, you're brilliant. Right? Like high intention, high intention. Like I'm getting to the top of the hill, low attachment. So any hard thing, yeah, like anything, it's your perception of hard, number one. 
and then have that high attention, low attachment and just make it happen. And yes, the first day I slayed Talbot was quite an exciting day indeed. I can I imagine. I'd, I'd be I'd be crying. I'd be patting myself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was looking at footage. So I used to be much heavier and, and only three years ago, I started getting more fit. Um, but I was reviewing some footage earlier this week of myself. The first time I did five workouts in a week, um, and I was, I was crying. I was crying. I had tears in my eyes and I was thinking I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And the reason that this is, we do hard things. The reason why we focus on hard times is because n normally I would say that's really hard. And, and then I would stop like, like hard is enough of a reason not to do something for most of us. Right. But it's not, we know it's not, you know, it's not, I know it's not. And so now it's like, Oh, that's really hard. Oh, <laughs> Oh, I just said that out loud. Okay, now I have to do it, right? Like, like if you can't, you must type thinking. So for me, yes, everyone's version of heart is very different um, for sure. But it's what, what I'm just trying to do is just remove the excuse from myself. And then really, I love being able to connect with leaders like you and dig into some of those pinnacle moments because, because I have spent so much time and we all spend so much time looking at people ahead of us above us and just think they have the Midas touch. They have this gift from God. They have this thing that I don't have. And so sometimes on, on like, quite honestly, I like to just like scuff off a little bit of that shine just to show that you're real. We're real. It's like, you know, where you started is where people are today. And if they started today, like you started back then they could have what you have now. And that's, that's really my goal here. And as you can say, well, it's hard, but I'm going to do it anyway. But I agree with you. Most people say it's hard and then they stop out of fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And so your dream has to be bigger than your perception of hard. Mm -hmm. Right. Your desire, your goal has to be bigger, broader than your perception of hard. We do so how, hard do you that? how do you how do you dream it without the voice in the back of your head saying, yeah, right. You know, cause that's the other thing we get excited. We get excited. We're going to go do this thing. Like <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to go skydiving. I've called the company. Right. So, Oh, I feel great about you. You go, but you said it was two days, right? Two days right. later, you went skydiving in those two days. Trust me. I would have found reasons not to go. It's crazy. I called my mom. What the was I thinking? I called my dad. What the was I thinking? Right. Even the day driving there, Right. I was thinking, what was I thinking? But I asked my dad to come and watch. And so as soon as I saw my dad, I thought, OK, because he and I made eye contact and, and it became very clear why I was doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. It was it was a way to to bring me out of my grief. It was a way to bring me back to Leslie. It was a way to remind me um, that just because John didn't love me anymore doesn't mean I'm not lovable. I mean, it, it was all sorts of things. People ask me all the time, would you skydive again? I say, I absolutely would, but for completely different, different reasons, reasons. Yeah. right? And it was seeing my dad that to my soul, I knew why I was doing this, right? So that I didn't spiral down. I didn't, I, I didn't want, and not, you don't have to jump out of a, an airplane to, to, to overcome grief or whatever. It just happened to have been, my solution for getting out of that grief, I just knew I didn't want to be that, that bitter, mad, angry, you know, betrayed ex-wife. I, I knew I didn't want to be her. And if I kept spiraling through that grief, I, I didn't know where I would ultimately wind up. So it was, it was a way for me to, um, I don't know. It just seemed like the right way for me to tap into my courage. And since that day, Mark, I have been unstoppable. I have fears all day, every day. I just move through them at a, at a, you, at a and you easier see, pace. You're, you're so well-spoken. You are so confident in appearance. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not inside your, your head, but so well-spoken, so confident, so much experience. You, you, you know what you're talking about and you do it well. What are you afraid of? 
I'm afraid of having regrets. This is wild that you bring this up today. Okay, so uh, 61, the book just came out. Do you know how long I settled? Do you know how long I put that dream on the back burner? Do you know how long I was not willing to chase the, the level of impact I want to make in the world. I mean, when I see the top speakers, when I see the top influencers, and I love them all, and I'm inspired by them all, I don't compare myself and think I can't. I compare myself and think I should be there with them. That's my work in the world. And for too long, I settled. And while I was married, it's because they had a great corporate job, and we didn't want to slow down the retirement dream. And then I started working on it on my own, and then COVID stopped us for the last year from doing something. So I finally said, hell, this could be going on. Who knows how long this could be going on? Let's just self-publish and and let's we'll make it work and it'll all work mm-hmm. out perfectly. So in this morning, this is so funny. Uh, we're, we're having coffee and my I have this coffee clutch and there are six or eight of us meet. We all live in high rises, different different buildings, downtown San Diego. And over the years, we've just met and become a little group. And we meet on certain mornings and we chit chat. Now we're all standing on the sidewalk, six feet apart with our masks on. They're all older than me. They're all bragging about getting their second shot. I'm so jealous. First time in my life I ever wish I was older. But, you know, so, so we're talking this morning and they're all congratulating me on the book. And, and Paul said, so what's next? I'm like, what's next? Like I said, this is just the beginning. I said, I am 61. By 70, I'm going to do everything I can to live every dream and vision for my career and my life that I've had in my head so that I do not have any regrets. I said, I am more inspired now to move through my fears and make things happen. And I don't have to know how it's going to happen, Mark. I know you say I come across confident. I'm I'm inspired to be my best. Like I believe in the things I coach when I say, I don't want, you know, when people are, when you're settling, it's, 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 it's tapping into your innate greatness. You're frustrated and you're, you're playing small and it impacts your psyche and impacts what I call your zest for life. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live it. So that's a choice If settling is a choice. Then not settling is a choice. I am choosing to pursue the best life I can create for myself. I have fears, but I keep taking action. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I keep taking action. And to your whole theme, I'm not going to think about how hard it's going to be. I'm going to find the, the joy in the learning and the commitment and the discipline and the experiences and the failures and the successes and just keep moving. I love it. Can can I ask you a question? Can sure. you tell me about your tattoo and what it means to you? Oh, of course. Okay. So to, to set it up briefly, um, a few years ago, I got really sick and I am perfectly healthy now, but a few years ago, I think I'm not a doctor. I think I grieved so hard from the divorce. I literally made my body sick. I, I really believe you can do that now. At any I, rate, my immune I, system. I yes, believe. I think I think the things we think, I mean, I'm not a doctor either. The things we think, the things we eat, the movement certainly is all connected in my mind. All of it. I know. Like I'm, I'm much more clear now about taking good care of myself and what I eat, what I do and whatnot. That's, we could talk about that another day. So I got really sick. My immune system shut down and someone who was healthy, 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 healthy. Now I'm on low dose chemo and I was on meds for a couple of years. Nobody knew this. So <laughs> people watching, my, my clients are going to be quite surprised about this. Nobody knew because it was nobody's business, right? It was personal. I went through it. So I would take the stage. I'd go into my hotel room, burst into tears. The long hours, really difficult. Mondays, Tuesdays were med days, had to start fitting naps into the whole situation. And with all the travel and all of the speaking and everything, I mean, you find yourself alone a lot of the time as you're doing this, right? Right. And I'd always burst into tears after a long day. So I learned to tell myself you're crying out of fatigue and not sadness. That helped a lot. So I could just cry. My life's great. 
I'm just tired, right? Because sometimes we can just start crying and then and then that becomes pervasive. And then, I, then you start being unhappy in all areas. You know, I had to really define these tears are fatigue related, not that you are unhappy about things. I had that conversation in the airplane many, many times <laughs> coming home. But anyways, um, got all better got off the meds, got healthy, and I wanted to celebrate. And so I got this tattoo as my, I'm off my meds and perfectly happy. And so if you can see it, it is a present. Yes. And so what it represents is life is a gift. Stay present and keep my heart open. I love that. I love guy, that. Thank you. The, the guy said, you thought really hard about that. I said, what do you think? I'm just going to come in and have you put Popeye on my Come on, like this is a tattoo. It's like, yeah, it reminds me to stay present and no regrets. Oh my gosh, no. Oh no, I love it. I'm gonna get another one. I think we a little cycler, little cycle, little little cycle going up my left ankle, I, riding I up, going up the hill, man. That is so cool. That is so cool. And and the reason I asked is because I I mean I was uh, I I heard you speak about it a little bit, but I didn't. You know, you you kind of spoke about it quickly, and I was and whenever someone speaks about something quickly, I'm always like, hmm, there's there's a story there, and and really, you can learn so much from people by just asking, hey, what's the story behind that tattoo? And so it's just because it's a moment of life and it's so meaningful for most people. I'm, I'm kind of too afraid to get one. I, I'm going to get one. I just don't know what I want to get that I'd be comfortable representing this moment in my life for the rest of my life. And that's wait till, you know, like I knew and I look at it. I never had one thought of I wish I wasn't there or I wish I hadn't done it. Like yeah. I look at it and I love it. My mother, my hysterical mother says, why didn't you put it on your back above your butt? Like the girls do. I said, mom, the whole point is to remind me about being present. Like if I can't see it, how's it going to remind me to stay present? <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, so going back to outrageous achievement, your new book that, that just came out, who did you write this for? And, and the reason I ask it that way is often when when we're, when when we are putting together stuff, it's coming out of all these experiences that we have. And often I hear people say, "I wrote it for me. I created it for me. I did it for me." And it serves others. Was this book? Who is this book written for? Is this, is this written for you? Is this written for the old version of you? Who is this for? Well, that's so funny. When it came down to the dedication, I knew exactly, and I wrote it. I said, "This is for you, the readers." Like it did. I didn't even hesitate. Like the first time. Uh, the team said, what about the dedication? I'm like, oh, that's easy. I'll send you, I'll send you a couple sentences, right? Not right now. Like it came out immediately. This is for you, the readers, and my sincere wish that you create outrageous achievement in all areas of your life. It is completely a labor of love and service. Wasn't even a second thought. Now, my mom wished I would have dedicated it to her. I said, and I appreciate that, mom, and I love you. But you know what? It was for the readers. Good question, though. You sound close to your parents. I mean, you spoke, you've spoken about your father. You've spoken about your mother. What is that, what is that relationship like for you? Because yeah. they're watching, I mean, I imagine they're watching their daughter who has lived a certain life for a certain time. And then this very big thing happens. And suddenly they must just think, she's gone bananas. <laughs> yeah. Well, I lost my father uh, two um, years ago. I'm sorry to it, hear that. It's okay. He had a great life. Um, my parents divorced when I went away to school and he had a total romance with Sharon, like 35 years of a love story. So it was beautiful. He was fiercely loved and he had a stroke and his last meal um, before he lived a couple years after the stroke and then his last meal before he passed was his favorite. He had fried chicken and ice cream and passed in his sleep. I mean, what a good gig, right? So even though I miss him and I think of him every day and I know Sharon's life has been really impacted. I know how much she misses him. Um, I know dad had a really good life and we were very, very close. And I'm also very close with my mother. My mom is my best friend. 
my mom is absolutely my best friend. She turns 85 this year and she does yoga and she hikes and she's hysterical fun. Uh, her boyfriend's 12 years, her junior, I tease her, um, but he keeps her young. And uh, we talk every day. I do miss seeing her in person since COVID a year now. Um, we haven't got together, um, but we talk all the time and I'm very, very grateful. And I do not take our friend. We're more like sisters. We're more like best friends. And I do not take that relationship for granted for one second. So did they, so. did they watch this transformation and, and is your mom watching this new version of you just kind of marveling at what you're doing or, or, because again, I, I'm just playing in my head. I can imagine her also saying, ah, I'm seeing the little girl who was there when she was five or what have you. And, and you're, you've now refound yourself kind of thing. I've totally refound myself. I've refound myself. You know, every tough situation transforms us one way or the other. And like, all your listeners, like I've had my moments and I think they're, I don't think I know each one. So like I was um, bankrupt early on, had a big building business that went under because of a water moratorium. A um, couple of years later, I had my house burned down and I lost all my stuff and, and went through that. Um, I've told you about divorce. Um, I've told you about illness. I mean, I've had these situations happen. And I'm a big sports fan, Mark, so I love to quote Vince Lombardi. He's a very famous quote, whether people know it's from Vince Lombardi or not, is it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. And I tell the audience and myself, it's not whether you get knocked down, because we know we're going to get knocked down. It's whether you get back up transformed. Mm. And that is a choice of how we get back up, not only the pace of getting back up, like how long do we stay fetal on the floor? Like it's not only the pace of getting back up, but it's the direction we go, the emotional direction we go as we get back up. Am I going over here as a victim? Woe is me, things never happen. This is just ruined me forever. Or am I gonna take the lessons and the hard knocks and dust myself off, get even more clear on my vision, find some kind of gratitude, find some kind of lesson in the getting knocked down and get back up transformed. And my choice is to get back up transformed in as positive a way as possible. That is, that is amazing. Uh, it's it. You know what? I, I've heard you mention about this choice so much, you know, like, like it is something that you, you, you talk about quite a bit. It's like, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. If, if we're not used to know, if we don't know it's a choice and we're not used to making that choice, how do we even go about, how do we even go about making the choice? Your house burns down. There's nothing you can do to control that. How you choose to react to the situation dictates how your next few years, how angry or bitter or upset you might be. Or, or every time, you know, someone mentions a memory and you no longer have that photo, you can get angry and say, I used to have this photo, but my house burned. So it's a choice, but we're not even trained to make this choice. How do we go about doing the right choice? Okay, well, first of all, again, change begins with awareness. Realize that you do have a choice in all areas of your life, right? The solution to all this, Mark, truly is a commitment to personal development, is a commitment to do the work. When I read your, we do hard things, right? To me, the solution is, okay, why, how do we do hard things easier? Through our commitment to personal development, like doing the work, meaning work harder on yourself. Jim Rohn said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job, right? Marianne Williamson says, you've got to learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be. So that commitment to personal development, I have a whole chapter on personal development. And even though I know not everybody's um, willing to make that commitment. I tried to give all these different options of reading, audiobooks, yoga, meditation, journaling, vision work. Like I tried to give them many different options so that they can to, in some way begin to work on themselves. And I'm really a big believer in the personal development reading or audiobooks if people don't dig the, the, the reading. And when I talk about personal development reading, I'm not talking about spiritual books which are good. And I read spiritual books, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about books on leadership. I have a whole shelf on leadership books. 
and I read them, but that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about um, people who have had high levels of success, right? Biographies of success. Biographies, memoirs, those kind of things. Even though those are all inspiring, I'm talking about the type of book that gets you to think about you. Mm -hmm. So that to your point, you can start to realize your full potential, that you have been playing small, that you do have options, that you can dream bigger, that you can move forward, that you can redefine who you are, how you want to walk through the world. It's a choice. It is everything we think about, our actions, our decisions, they are choices, but they come from a willingness to start to figure ourselves out, pay attention to our thoughts, don't be reactive, be proactive, and walk through the world on your terms. <laughs> and I, I believe people will find that it's you're still going to fall down. You're still going to have failures. Not everyone's going to like you. And yet the empowerment that comes from walking through the world on your terms, it's so much more satisfying than being a reactive, disappointed victim. Amen. (laughs) I just like, yep. That's Mic great. Drop. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so Leslie, what, what sh- didn't I ask you that I really should have asked you? What did you not ask me that you really should have asked me? That's a great question. I'm going to go. What? What have I added to my life's tools that have made a big impact over the last couple of years that have surprised me? How about that? Yeah, that let's, comes let's, to mind. Let's touch on that. So, I mean, I'm not going to even throw to the, the question to you or anything like that. Let's. So that's what I should have asked you. So what are the life tools that you've added that really surprised you? Meditation, number one. Mm. I would have bet you a zillion dollars. I couldn't shut my little brain for five seconds. Do you think there's a difference? And this is a personal thing between meditation and prayer or, or, or journaling or those kind of like more inside quiet type things. I believe I am not an expert in this. I do those, all those things. I do pray. I do journal and I do meditate and I Mm. see them as complimentary, but to distinctly different things. Mm. Journaling is the words are coming out. I'm thinking and doing and going and praying. I'm trying to be quiet and centered and, and send my thoughts out to the universe, like whatever anybody's spiritual beliefs are, right? I call it grace just to try to encapsulate no matter what anybody's beliefs are. So, you know, touching into that grace meditation for me is that quiet time settling into my soul, settling into my self, the, the more quiet I am, the, 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 I mean, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> you got yourself there. <laughs> it was hard, but I told myself it was worth it. Right. So I didn't, I, I was hard, but I did it anyway because my desire to meditate superseded my perception of how hard it was and so i came up with a solution because it was hard in the beginning i couldn't do it so i decided i'll do guided medication meditation so i had her in my head for a year and i started with two minutes and worked up to five minutes and finally worked up to 20 minutes and then i went to self-guided meditation meaning sitting by myself and went from five minutes to 10 minutes, the results from getting quiet, the results from that quiet, silent time are priceless. And I believe the reason people don't do it is exactly for the, it's hard. Um, We can't, we don't feel like we're doing it right. And that's the whole lesson. It's not about doing it right. It's about just doing it. And that's hard for many of us. And the results have been more humility, more tolerance, more patience. I mean, it was obvious almost immediately these benefits of meditation. And as I mentioned earlier, I do core work, uh, core value work. 
twice a year. So I'm very keen on my core values. I believe there, I did a whole segment in the book on core values because I believe that when you have clarity around your core values, it's a driver of behavior. So things, even if you are afraid or if, if you do doubt, you're still going to move forward. So I was doing core value work perhaps a year after I started meditating and I had noticed over the years that like the top 10, perhaps core values were always, you know, always kind of in that top 10 and maybe the one, two, three spot, depending on what was going on in my life shifted around. Like when I was healthy, health was always in there. And then when I got sick, bam, like health was, mm -hmm. it was number one. So a, a few years ago, I was doing my core value work and silence came in as a core value. And that really caught me by surprise. Like I'm a woman of many words. <laughs> and I thought, where the heck did silence come from? And I had to stop for a moment and consider. And it's because of the benefit meditation has made to my life. And so now a core value for me is that quiet, silent time. It's when I, the minute I sit on the mat, I say to myself, this is for me, right? I don't say this is hard anymore. I say, this is for me. This is a gift for me, right? So meditation has made a huge difference in my life. And I write about it and I challenge people to just do it. You're never going to do it right. Your head's always going to be full. There's marvelous books about meditation that can walk you through it. It's a choice like anything else. Um, again, we are going at such a frenetic pace these days from early morning to late at night. We are always plugged in having a few minutes like we're worth five or 10 or 20 minutes a day to sit in silence and prove it to yourself that the benefits will far outweigh any perceived inability to do it or any perceived waste of time. Like if I could guarantee you that if you put some time into meditation, it would change your life. If I guaranteed you, most people would do it. I, I, I think you just gave me a new quote or maybe even a tagline for this, which is it's not hard. It's for me. I like, I like that reframing a lot, actually. <laughs> Reframing is so important. Again, our perception of things, reframing is, I have a sticky all over my house that I put up when I was sick and I've never taken it down because they just, I like it. Be willing to see things differently. Mm. Like when I would start spiraling into the fear, the, the, the meds and what's going to happen and the no diagnosis and oh my gosh, I'm too young. And I'm like, what happened? How did this happen? And I would just, I have it everywhere. I have it in the bathroom. I have it on the wall. I have it in the door. I have it's your next tattoo. You know, it could very well be my next study would be willing to see things differently. And unlike my mother's desire, I'm going to have to put it somewhere where I can see it. Yes. Because <laughs> it's another one of those reminder ones. <laughs> yes. Leslie, thank you so much. Before we go, because we are up against the hour and I appreciate your time. Um, tell me the most important thing about the book. The most important thing about the book, it's going to change your life. I, I truly believe that, that there will be a concept or a story that I tell or strategies that I give that will help you make a shift, a breakthrough and truly tap into your full potential. Even perhaps just see that full potential, which will inspire you to take actions like never before. And that truly is my wish for people with the book Outrageous Achievement. Oh, that was so much fun. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, your desire to reach your goals needs to be greater than your perception of what is hard. Number two, sometimes it's better to wait before responding to calls or texts or emails. Give yourself time, breathe. That way you can respond not from an emotional place, from a place of love and caring and humanity. And number three, when it comes to any of the hard things you do, have high intentions, but low attachment, and then just make it happen. I love that. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and then you must 
say yes. If you're ready for another push, you have got to hear the conversation I had with this confidence coach. Click on the link right over there. Empathy and kindness. So I have that side of me too. As a woman, when we do compare ourselves to another woman, it's almost as if that woman is taking something away from us.